Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I hope you all had a pleasant uh, day off of class uh, when I was not here. Um, but what I would like to do today is continue with our discussion of black holes. Um, last time we studied the Schwarzschild solution as a black hole, and we discovered that the solution has event horizons, and even if you dive behind the event horizon of a, the Schwarzschild black hole, uh, you would discover another asymptotic region. Um, this is a region that you couldn't get to uh, if you just followed a normal time-like geodesic. But if you dive behind the event horizon of a black hole, uh, in that short amount of time before you got crushed by the singularity, uh, you would meet people from this other asymptotic region. Uh, however, we decided that uh, this other universe on the other side of the Schwarzschild black hole uh, was most likely a mathematical artifact. And it was a, a mathematical artifact of the fact that when we wrote down the Schwarzschild solution for a uh, black hole, we assumed not only that the black hole was spherically symmetric, but we assumed that it was static. So we assumed that it didn't change in time, and in particular, had been there for the entire history of the universe. Uh, now, of course, um, realistic black holes, uh, which is to say uh, those black holes uh, which are observed at least indirectly uh, through telescopes uh, are not eternal black holes. They have not been there forever, but instead uh, they are formed by collapse. And so what I would like to do today is... Um, I would like to spend one lecture giving you just a brief tour through the physics of black holes. So I will start by talking about the formation of black holes, and then uh, I will move on and talk about the zoo of black hole solutions that one can write down in general relativity, uh, in addition to the Schwarzschild black hole, so that we can start to understand their physical implications and the variety of different physics uh, principles that are involved with black holes. Um, and so today, uh, the style of lecture is going to be slightly different in that I am not going to uh, prove all of the statements that I am making to you. I am just going to make some true statements um, whose proof, I think, is uh, beyond the scope of these lectures, um, just to give you a bit of a flavor uh, for the physics of black holes um, sort of as uh, it's studied uh, by active researchers in the field. Uh, so... Um, Let's begin just by talking a bit about the formation of black holes. So the basic principle that you need to keep in mind when thinking about the formation of black holes is that it is difficult for matter to collapse into a black hole um, because a typical black hole uh, will have all of its mass crammed into a Schwarzschild radius, uh, which is absolutely tiny um, for astrophysical objects like uh, the Sun or the Earth. Uh, and in, in, in particular, uh, for most sorts of objects, uh, there will be some sort of pressure which will prevent objects Um, uh, from wanting to collapse. So in particular, this pressure will cause objects to expand rather than collapse. So if you imagine that you have a star or some other sort of uh, astrophysical object, uh, you have the gravitational force, which makes that object want to contract and makes it want to collapse. <coughs> And then you have some sort of pressure, uh, which depends on uh, the sort of matter that makes up that object, which will make the object want to expand. Uh, so, for example, uh, for the typical star, uh, we have various nuclear processes that are going on inside the star. In particular, we have nuclear fusion, um, which will keep the radius of the star much, much larger than the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, in the sun, for example, we have hydrogen fusing into helium, which releases a huge amount of energy, uh, which creates pressure, 
Um, so in the equation of state of the fluid that describes the sun, there's a great deal of pressure which will counteract the gravitational attraction of the various constituents of the sun, which would make it want to collapse. Now, as a star evolves, uh, the various uh, elements in the star will fuse and you will obtain fusion processes with higher and higher elements on the periodic table. So as the sun evolves, uh, the hydrogen fuses into helium. Eventually, the sun will run out of helium. The helium will in turn start fusing into lithium uh, and so on and so forth uh, until eventually all of the fusion processes are exhausted. So eventually, these various nuclear processes are exhausted and the star collapses. And the question then is, what sort of object is formed when the star collapses? So um, if we have a star which has exhausted all of its sources of nuclear fuel, uh, then there are still various types of pressure uh, which could keep the star from uh, collapsing into a black hole. And in particular, could keep the radius of the star larger than the Schwarzschild radius. That's the criteria for when an object has formed a black hole. Now, uh, it turns out that there are three possible outcomes. So the first outcome is the following. So if the mass is too small, and in particular, if it's smaller than about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, uh, which is usually denoted by M with a subscript and then the, the Greek symbol for the sun, which is a circle with a dot in it. So in that case, um, the star will form what is known as a white dwarf. So what is a white dwarf? Well, uh, let's imagine that we have a bunch of matter together. So we have a bunch of atoms that are all being compacted together by gravitational forces. Now, you know, of course, of one very fundamental source of pressure, which even in the absence of any fancy nuclear forces would keep this object from collapsing to an arbitrarily small size. And that is the Pauli exclusion principle. So the atoms which make up uh, a star are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And all of those electrons will form uh, energy levels, just as they do for the hydrogen atom. And because they're fermions, there will be a Pauli exclusion principle, which will keep these electrons from all wanting to be in the same state. This is now a source of pressure, which will keep the star from collapsing. And if uh, the mass of the star is uh, sufficiently small, uh, where small here is less than a little bit larger than the mass of the sun, then this uh, degeneracy pressure coming from electrons so this would be electron degeneracy pressure will keep the star from collapsing. So a white dwarf should be thought of as a large atom. What is an atom? An atom is an object whose structure is determined by its electron energy levels. So uh, a white dwarf is a kind of star, but the physics that governs a white dwarf is uh, atomic physics. It's the physics of electron energy levels. So uh, you should think of a white dwarf as an as a star uh, of astronomical size, literally. Um, and because the theory of electrons, electron levels, and atomic uh, Atomic structure uh, is known very well. Uh, this is the theory, the sort of classic theory of quantum mechanics. In fact, uh, the process of uh, the, the formation of a white dwarf um, is understood uh, reasonably well. And this bound that I have written here in terms of 1.4 uh, times the mass of the sun is actually a quite well-known bound. Um, it was worked out uh, by Chandrasekhar, uh, and it's known as the Chandrasekhar limit. Now, what happens if an object is, uh, has a mass which is greater than uh, 1.4 times the mass of the sun? Well, clearly, if you keep increasing the mass, something must happen. 
And what happens is that the electrons that uh, in this uh, star are creating the degeneracy pressure will tunnel into the nuclei uh, of the atoms. So we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, typically, the electrons are separated from the nuclei, the protons and neutrons, by a potential barrier, which arises due to nuclear forces. But if the gravitational pressure is sufficiently strong, then it can overcome that force, and the electrons will tunnel through this barrier into the nuclei and uh, combine with the protons in order to form uh, neutrons. So if the mass is greater than this limit, so the mass is greater than 1.4 solar masses and less than an amount which is not known quite as precisely, but which is thought to be around four solar masses, then all of the electrons and protons will combine and we get an object which is made only of neutrons, uh, which will be significantly smaller than a white dwarf because we now no longer have the uh, electron degeneracy pressure and is known as a neutron star. So a neutron star, so whereas a white dwarf should be thought of as a giant atom, a neutron star should be thought of a as a giant nucleus of an atom because it's an object uh, which is just made of neutrons and which is prevented from collapsing into a black hole by neutron degeneracy pressure. And in fact, uh, because the theory of nuclear physics is not nearly as well understood as the theories of atomic physics, neutron stars are, uh, from a fundamental physics point of view, uh, much more mysterious objects. The equation of state that governs the dynamics of a neutron star is the same equation of state that governs the dynamics of the nuclei at the center of atoms, which is the same equation of state that people are studying in high energy accelerators. Uh, for example, the Brookhaven accelerator collides gold, gold atoms together in order to create giant blobs of nuclear matter, which they then study. So, um, Neutron stars are one of the primary places where we can study uh, nuclear matter, where we can study the equation of state uh, that describes uh, very dense matter at the core of an atom in the nucleus. So uh, the, the upper limit on the mass of a neutron star is not known incredibly precisely, uh, simply because the theory of interacting nuclei um, is uh, a theory which is not particularly well understood. Uh, we know what the theory is, but it's a rather difficult theory to study. Um, the standard perturbation techniques, for example, that you use in quantum mechanics fail uh, to apply. So other techniques must be used, either uh, lattice simulations or strongly coupled field theory techniques. And um, they're generally much more mysterious objects. So I think neutron stars, um, otherwise known as pulsars, are uh, one of those... Um, situations, one of those fascinating situations where the study of astrophysics collides with the study of fundamental particle physics. And by understanding particle physics, you can learn about neutron stars. By understanding neutron stars, you can learn about particle physics. By understanding any of those, you can learn about general relativity. Because neutron stars are stars which are not um, smaller than their Schwarzschild radius, but they're not so much bigger than their own Schwarzschild radius. Uh, so the typical neutron star has a size that's of order uh, some few kilometers. Uh, if you remember, the Schwarzschild radius of the sun uh, is around three kilometers, I think. So these are objects whose size is of order the Schwarzschild radius, but they're not quite uh, within their own Schwarzschild radius, and so they're not quite black holes. But nevertheless, um, the study of neutron stars is a fantastic probe of general relativity. Uh, indeed, um, perhaps the most precise tests of general relativity um, in the strong uh, gravitational regime uh, come from neutron stars, uh, from studies of binary pulsars um, and stuff like that. Okay. If we keep cranking up the mass of this object, 
then the Schwarzschild radius will increase linearly, whereas the physical radius, so if we imagine that the neutron star has some constant density, then as the mass increases, the radius will increase with the mass to the one-third power, whereas the Schwarzschild radius increases linearly in the mass. Remember, the Schwarzschild radius is just equal to the mass times Newton's constant. So eventually, if the mass is sufficiently large, then the object will be inside its own event horizon, and we have a black hole. Now, this number four, of course, is not known exactly. It only depends on, uh, it depends on the details of the nuclear matter. Uh, in particular, it depends on um, the equation of state of nuclear matter, which would be determined, solved to determine the size of a neutron star. But um, if the mass is larger than four times the Schwarzschild radius, then we have an object which is, for all intents and purposes, a black hole because it, the radius is inside its own event horizon. And it will have many of the features of the Schwarzschild black hole that we studied last class. But one of the salient differences is that um, these physical black holes have no white hole singularity. And they have no um, other universe on the other side of the horizon. Now, um, if we wanted to, we could certainly come up with a simple model for a realistic black hole, which would be formed by the collapse of some matter. Um, if you look in your textbook, um, there's a section devoted to coming up with such a model. In the interest of time, um, I won't go through it here, um, but I'll just ask you to uh, take as fact, uh, I think it's an uh, almost obvious fact, uh, that there will be no white hole singularity um, for uh, the solution that describes a black hole formed by physical collapse. Uh, why is there no white hole singularity? Well, the white hole singularity was something that lived in the far past. And if these black holes are formed by the collapse of some smooth matter distribution uh, with very, very low energy density, then there's nothing particularly fancy going on. So there's nothing in the far past. Is that, that was what your question was? Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Are there any questions on that? So um, the goal here was just to give you a little bit of a flavor for um, what sort of black holes are actually out there. Um, I should say that, of course, we don't directly observe black holes because there's nothing to observe uh, because they're black. But we observe black holes indirectly in a variety of different ways. Um, so, for example, um, we study the motion of objects around a black hole and we can see that there's a mass which is present um, at a particular location at the center of the Milky Way, for example, by studying the motion of stars that are in orbit around uh, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And by very carefully studying those orbits, we can determine the size and the mass of the object at the center of the Milky Way, and we can conclude that it's inside its own Schwarzschild radius. Okay, that is practically the definition of a black hole. Um, so this was just a little bit of a brief primer on um, astrophysical black holes. Now I would like to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the whole zoo of black hole solutions that appear in general relativity. Uh, before I do so, let me pause and see if there are any questions. No questions? Okay. So... The black holes that we have dis discussed so far in this class are black holes that are parameterized by a single number, which is the mass of the black hole. And it turns out that the most general black hole that you can have in uh, general relativity is parameterized not by one number, 
but by two numbers. So it turns out that the most general black hole solution is uh, not spherically symmetric, but instead has uh, only one symmetry, which is a symmetry under an axis of angular rotation. And it is parameterized not just by a mass, but by a mass m and angular momentum j. So if you have an object with a mass and an angular momentum, then you have a solution which does not have the three, uh, sorry, four killing vectors of the Schwarzschild solution, but instead you have an object which is axisymmetric, which is to say it is a solution of Einstein's equations with two killing vectors. So it has a time-like killing vector, which we could call d by dt, as well as a killing vector, which generates a rotation about an axis of symmetry, which we could call d by d phi. And it's a remarkable and uh, rather surprising fact uh, that the solution to the axisymmetric Einstein's equations are in fact uniquely determined by uh, the mass and the angular momentum of this solution. And this goes under the name, uh, the sort of fanciful name of the no hair theorem. So, um, which is the statement that the solution is uniquely parameterized by M and J. It's no hair because somehow uh, if there were other, so the mass and angular momentum of the black hole are things that you could measure off at infinity just by studying the motion of test particles in the, in the neighborhood of this black hole. If there were other pieces of data that described the parameters of this black hole, uh, then we would call them hair uh, if we wanted to be sort of fanciful. And this is the, the statement is that in general relativity, if you solve the equations of motion, uh, Einstein's equations uh, in the, with these particular symmetries, then th the solution I'm going to write down for you is the only solution uh, that can exist. Yes, there was a question though. Uh, yes, I am talking here about Einstein's equation rather than the Einstein-Maxwell equations. I'll discuss charged black holes in a minute. Um, so the no theory, the hair theorem actually says that if you have Einstein-Maxwell equations, then the solution is uniquely parameterized by a mass, angular momentum, and possibly an electric charge, uh, or if you want to be incredibly fancy, an electric and a magnetic charge. But uh, macroscopic objects carry an electric charge, which is infinitesimal compared to their mass and angular momentum, so usually, for the purpose of astrophysical objects, we can forget about the mass, the, the charge, um, especially the magnetic charge, although that would sure be interesting. Um, I should also mention that, of course, um, there are solutions that are not static with less symmetry that describe the perturbations of these objects. So, for example, if you have a Schwarzschild black hole and you just perturb it a little bit, then what will happen is it will oscillate and wobble around for a while, but it will eventually relax back down to the Schwarzschild black hole. So, um, and likewise for the rotating black hole, whose metric I will now describe for you, you could perturb it a little bit. Like, let's say you throw a cow into a black hole. Uh, the cow is not spherically or actually symmetric, presumably. Uh, and so that will cause some deviation from spherical or axial symmetry. Uh, which will cause the black hole to wobble around a little bit. But eventually those wobbles will, will die off and you'll return to the nice symmetric uh, rotating black hole solution that I will now write down. In fact, the study of uh, excitations of Schwarzschild and Kerr black holes 
is not only very interesting, but it's also very important for astrophysics, um, as you can imagine, because realistic black holes that are being formed from collapse are not completely static objects. Uh, instead, they're constantly being perturbed by infalling matter uh, in some interesting way. So, <coughs> the solution that describes the rotating black hole is a metric which you either will check or have checked is a solution of Einstein's equations for your next problem set. Um, you know, we're no longer uh, children, and so uh, we have to face the fact that Einstein's equations are complicated nonlinear differential equations that are quite difficult to solve. And sometimes the solutions are much less simple than you would like, which means that I'll have quite amount of quite a bit of talking to do to keep you entertained while I write down the Kerr metric. And I'll need to give myself a little bit of room. So for example, uh, it's perfectly possible to show analytically that the Kerr solution is a solution of the equations of motion of Einstein gravity. But on the problem set that you either have solved or will solve, I, in my infinite mercy, have asked you to show it only uh, using a numerical computing package uh, which you have written yourselves. So, okay, I'm almost done here. So let's start taking a look at this solution. Now, given how complicated this solution is, Uh, you are perhaps not surprised that the solution was only discovered many decades after uh, the invention of general relativity. Um, I believe it was discovered in the 50s. So let's just uh, pause and take a look at this metric for a few minutes. So the first thing to notice is that here I have described my space-time in terms of four coordinates, t, phi, theta, and r. So my symmetries are time translation and one rotation symmetry. So I have uh, a time translation vector d by dt, which is a killing vector, as you can see, by noting that the components of the metric are independent of t. And likewise, we have a rotation symmetry, which is a symmetry as you can see by noting that the components of the metric are all independent of phi. We have a radial coordinate r, and we have a coordinate theta, which is the other angular coordinate, uh, which is not a symmetry coordinate. So this solution does not have a killing vector that describes rotations in the theta direction. Instead, uh, you should think of it, uh, I'll draw some pictures in a minute, you should think of it as an object that is sort of uh, an ellipsoid rather than a sphere. And uh, there's a radial coordinate r, and in writing down the metric, I have defined these two functions, rho and delta, which are functions of r and theta, which will help us uh, write, study the solution in a rather uh, simple way. So this then describes a rotating black hole where the rotation is around the axis of symmetry. So the rotation is the angular momentum J is the conserved quantity associated with the vector D by D phi just like the mass is the conserved quantity associated with d by dt. So let me, um, I don't want to spend too much time uh, in the, dealing with the nitty gritty of this solution because as you can see, it's a little horrific. Um, but I do want to spend a few minutes telling you about some interesting features of this solution because 
In doing so, we will discuss some interesting features of general relativity that we have not yet encountered in this course. And so this will be a good chance for us to discover some of the bizarre and wonderful features of general relativity, which have not yet been evident in our discussion of the simple Schwarzschild solution. Okay. So the first thing that uh, I would like to point out is that this solution asymptotically approaches Minkowski space, just like the Schwarzschild black hole. So this is indeed the correct solution that will describe a black hole with angular momentum. And in fact, the typical astrophysical black hole will have angular momentum in addition to mass. And so uh, this is the metric of the typical astrophysical black hole. Or at least, it is the metric of the typical astrophysical black hole um, as long after one has waited sufficiently long that all of the initial wobbles and fluctuations of the black hole that uh, occur when the black hole is formed have died away. So it's sort of remarkable that if you just look at the typical astrophysical uh, black hole solution, it's parameterized only by two numbers. Now let's go ahead and stare at this metric for a few minutes. So the first thing that I would like to point out to you is that just as with the Schwarzschild black hole, this metric has a horizon. Now with the Schwarzschild black hole, the horizon was the place where the coefficient of dt squared went to zero and the coefficient of dr squared went to infinity. For this solution, we see, however, that the coefficient of dt squared is not the inverse of the coefficient of dr squared. So there are two different kinds of surfaces that we need to think about. There's the surface where the coefficient of dr squared goes to infinity, and there's the surface where the coefficient of dt squared goes to zero. And we need to think about what the appropriate physical interpretation of those two different surfaces are. So let's first consider the surface where the coefficient of dr squared goes to zero. Uh, sorry, goes to infinity. And you can see by looking at the coefficient of dr squared that that happens when this function delta will go to uh, zero. So this is what is called the horizon of the black hole. So the solution has a horizon when delta is equal to zero. So when is delta equal to zero? Well, delta is a quadratic function of r. So in fact, delta will be equal to zero at two values of r. So in fact, we see that the solution has two event horizons where delta is equal to zero. And there are values of r, which I will call r plus and minus, that are just obtained by setting delta equal to zero and solving the quadratic equation. So there gm is r is equal to gm plus or minus the square root of g squared m squared minus a squared. And the parameter a is just j over m. It's a parameter with order length that parameterizes the angular momentum of the black hole in units of the mass. Okay, so we see that the rotating black holes have both inner and outer horizons. And um, one might then begin to ask, what is the physical interpretation of these two different horizons? And it's actually 
pretty easy to show just by integrating, uh, by studying the geodesics in the Kerr spacetime, that an observer who moves less than or equal to the speed of light can never escape from within, uh, can never escape to infinity from within the outer horizon. So the outer event horizon, where R is equal to R plus, is the surface that plays the role of the event horizon uh, in the sense that we usually think of it. Okay. Well, we mentioned earlier, though, that there was another surface that was worth discussing, which was the surface where the coefficient of dt squared went to zero. So, the surface where uh, the coefficient of dt squared, which is the same as the norm of the killing vector, d by dt, goes to zero, is given by setting the coefficient of dt squared here equal to zero. So I'll just copy down that coefficient here. So it's found by setting 1 minus 2 gm r over rho squared equal to 0, where rho, I'll remind you, was equal to r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta. So this occurs at a radius, which is found, again, just by uh, solving the, you just solve this equation for r, and r is equal to gm plus the square root of g squared m squared minus a squared cosine squared theta. And what I want you to do is compare that to the expression for r plus that we have up here. So we see that the coefficient of dt squared goes to zero, which is to say the norm of the killing vector d by dt goes to zero, happens at a radius which is larger than r plus. So outside of the event horizon of the black hole, there is a surface where the coefficient of dt squared equals to zero. And this surface where this value of r down here will be equal to zero will intersect the horizon only at theta equals to zero or pi, which is like the north and the south pole of the event horizon. So this uh, surface has a name. It is known as the stationary limit surface. And it is outside the event horizon of the black hole. Uh, which is at r equals to r plus, which was gm plus the square root of g squared m squared minus a squared. Okay. Well, okay, so we could then come up with a little bit of a picture of the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, sorry, of the Kerr black hole. So the event horizon of the black hole is given by r equals r plus. And outside of that, we have the stationary limit surface, which looks something like that, which intersects the event horizon at the north and south pole. So this is r plus. Uh, this is the stationary limit surface. And then inside the black hole, we have a second horizon at r minus. And although I haven't uh, shown it to you, uh, there is a singularity uh, 
So the singularity... So where is the singularity? The singularity... Let's go back up here to our metric. So the coefficient of dr squared is rho squared over delta squared. Remember that the singularity of a, the Schwarzschild black hole happened when uh, r went to zero, which was where the coefficient of dr squared went to zero. And that it happens to be the same for the Schwarzschild black hole. So uh, for the Kerr black hole. So the Kerr black hole has a singularity when rho is equal to zero. Uh, which is to say, um, at r squared plus a squared cosine squared theta is equal to zero. So this is the singularity at the core of the black hole. But it turns out that the norm of the killing vector d by d phi doesn't shrink to zero at that point. So unlike the Schwarzschild black hole, where the singularity was a point in space-time, uh, the singularity of the Kerr black hole is actually a ring in space-time. So this is a ring rather than a point. So the structure, just a second, of the Kerr black hole uh, is actually rather different from that of the Schwarzschild black hole. So first of all, the singularity is a ring rather than a point. Uh, you could literally jump through it if you wanted to, and if the black hole was sufficiently massive and had sufficiently large angular momentum, uh, you would be just fine. Um, it has two horizons, not one horizon. And it has this funny thing that I've called a stationary limit surface. And so now um, what I would like to do is I would like to investigate what the implications are of this funny stationary limit surface for the physics of observers near a Kerr black hole. But let me first pause and see if there are any questions. Yes? Um, we'll see. Yes? We'll see. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, <sorry. laughs> well, yeah, those are all things that we'll answer in a few minutes. Yes? How does Roy Kazir describe a ring when um, it's because this is just a location, so r is a function of theta, um, but there's also a phi coordinate. And so we also have a singularity for each value of phi. Okay, and phi is a circle. So that's why this thing parameterizes a circle. Why didn't this happen for the Schwarzschild black hole? Well, because uh, r, the singularity at r equals zero is also the point where the sphere, spherical part of the Schwarzschild metric shrank to zero size. The point is that the phi part of the metric doesn't shrink to zero size for the singularity. Yes. Yes, so r is equal to 0, theta is equal to pi over 2. But, oh, but rho is your spatial coordinate. Yes, rho is my spatial coordinate. I also have an angular coordinate, phi, which is going to be non-zero. So r is just a parameter? Yeah, r, you know, as always in general relativity, we use whatever coordinates uh, we damn well please. Um, we could have used rho as a radial coordinate instead of r, uh, but then things would have looked a little bit uh, different and um, well, uh, these coordinates are particularly convenient for us because in the R coordinate, the event horizon is at a fixed value of R that's independent of theta. But if I wanted to think of this metric as having some radial uh, coordinate from, uh, as being the distance from the origin of our coordinates. Well, let's put it this way. What is the salient feature? So when you, I think the correct way to think about these coordinates is the following. When we go out to infinity, far from the black hole, these become in Minkowski space. But you need to ask Minkowski space in what coordinates. In the Schwarzschild black hole, it became Minkowski space in spherical coordinates. Here it becomes Minkowski space in ellipsoidal coordinates. Okay, we haven't really discussed ellipsoidal coordinates. I think you might have had one problem set on them. Um, but if you really wanted to think deeply about the physics of the Kerr black hole, you would probably want to start understanding those ellipsoidal coordinates. 
Um, so the surfaces of constant R in Minkowski space are ellipsoids. And you could see that by taking the Kerr metric out to large R and seeing what it looks like. Good question, though. Any other questions? Okay. So what does it mean to be inside the stationary limit surface? So let's give a name to this region here. So this region where the R is less than uh, R stationary but larger than R plus is a region which is causally accessible in the sense that if I'm some observer out at asymptotic infinity, I could send a graduate student in a rocket ship into the ergosphere and then have them come back out of the ergosphere and that would be just fine. There would, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. So it's causally accessible. But something very funny happens in the ergosphere. Inside the ergosphere, the coefficient of dt squared in the metric is no longer negative. It's positive. So, of course, in Minkowski space, the coefficient of dt squared is negative. That means that t is a time-like direction. The stationary limit surface is the place where the coefficient of dt squared vanishes. And the ergosphere is the region where the coefficient of dt squared is going to be positive. What does it mean for the coefficient of dt squared to be positive? This means that uh, an observer, or let me say it uh, the following way. This means that the world line of fixed r, theta, and phi is not a time-like world line. That means that it is impossible for an observer to sit at fixed r, theta, and phi. So what does that mean? That means that if I send my graduate student into the ergosphere of a black hole, then that, that uh, graduate student will have to, even if that graduate student accelerates as close to the speed of light as possible, that graduate student cannot sit at fixed theta and phi. So if that student is at fixed radius, then he or she is forced to rotate along with the black hole. So it is impossible to sit at fixed position on uh, the sphere or the angular coordinates um, as long as you're traveling less than the speed of light. So... Any time-like observer inside the ergosphere must rotate along with the black hole. So that means that... Um, Every observer who is sufficiently close to this black hole is dragged along with the black hole because the black hole is sort of forcing space-time itself to rotate along with the black hole inside the ergosphere. Question? Would that be synonymous with a closed time-like curve? It is not a closed time-like curve. Um, I'll discuss closed time-like curves at some point later in this lecture. This is going to be a really long lecture if, I don't, if I'm not careful. Um, so any observer inside the ergosphere must rotate along with the black hole. And this is an effect which is known as frame dragging. And loosely speaking, um, it is uh, the statement that space-time itself will get dragged along with uh, the uh, rotation of an object. So this is an extreme example of frame dragging. Uh, but, in fact, uh, this frame-dragging effect uh, can also be observed for satellites uh, rotating around the Earth um, to a much lesser extent. 
Now, uh, there's another uh, interesting effect associated with um, the ergosphere, uh, which also comes from the fact that the coefficient of dt squared has uh, the wrong sign. And that is uh, what is known as the Penrose process. So what is the Penrose process? Well, what does it mean for uh, the sign of dt squared to be positive instead of negative? So one of the uses of dt squared is that time is the direction that defines energy. Okay, energy is the quantity that generates time translation. So if energy, if the coefficient of dt squared changes sign, so does, uh, the, so does the energy of whatever object that I'm considering. So for example, if I took my graduate student and I gave him a piece of trash, okay, some paper I don't like. Um, so I tell my graduate student, go into the ergosphere and then take this paper that I don't like, maybe it's a very heavy paper, okay, uh, and throw it into the black hole. So that paper is something which has positive energy outside the ergosphere, but it has negative energy inside the ergosphere. And in particular, it has negative mass because mass is proportional to energy. So when my graduate student throws this paper into the black hole, that paper has negative mass and it decreases the energy of the black hole. And energy is conserved, so that means that my graduate student, when he or she comes out of the black hole, has gained energy. So what does that mean? That means that it is possible to extract energy, which is to say mass, from a Kerr black hole. Just uh, to reiterate, I have my graduate student go inside the ergosphere and throw in uh, a piece of trash uh, with uh, some correct values of, of mass and angular momentum. And then come out, well, co this graduate student will come out again with more energy uh, than they started with. And the black hole will have decreased in energy. And in fact, the way that this works is that the black hole will simultaneously decrease uh, its mass and angular momentum. Okay, that's awfully strange. For a Schwarzschild black hole, for example, this does not happen. If you throw something inside the black hole which has positive energy, then that has positive mass, it increases the size of the black hole. It's certainly hard to imagine how a black hole could decrease in size. And the interesting point is that when I undertake this Penrose process, the black hole does not decrease in size. It decreases in mass. It decreases in angular momentum. But it turns out that uh, the size of the black hole uh, properly defined does not decrease. So that even though it turns out the mass and angular momentum will decrease, the area of the event horizon will increase. So if I have a black hole which is sitting here, then if this black hole has some angular momentum, I can extract angular momentum from the black hole at the same time I extract energy from the black hole. But at some point, I'll have to stop um, when the mass is equal to the angular momentum, as we'll see. And at that point, the black hole has a, a sort of maximum area. OK. Um, Someone asked whether there were, what happens if we go through the, uh, well, maybe I should pause and see if there are any questions before I continue. Yes. So if you decrease the mass to zero. You it turns out that you cannot decrease the mass to zero. So 
you know, um, I haven't gone through the details of the Penrose process. Um, it's one of those, you know, as I said, today we're just having a little bit of a tourist's guide uh, to the subject of black holes. Um, it, it's, the Penrose process is not particularly hard to understand. Uh, you could go at this point and look up Penrose's paper and read it. I mean, uh, it's also, I think, it might even be in Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler um, or in Wald's book on general relativity. It's not particularly hard. But if you go through the details, you'll see that you can actually, you can decrease the mass, but not to zero. And you can, uh, yeah. Yes, the event horizon always increases in area. It's a very counterintuitive effect. It's one of those strange things that you would never expect from general relativity, but it's true. Yes. You mentioned that you can observe frame dragging even on the scale of Bergman satellites. Yes. So, okay. Um, when I said observe that you can observe frame dragging, I actually lied. Um, you can build an experiment which claims to observe frame dragging, takes 40 years to build and doesn't work, um, uh, which is actually quite a sad story. Um, but uh, so with, with the Earth, of course, is rotating. The sun, of course, is rotating. And even though, obviously, uh, you know, we sitting at the surface of the Earth are not forced to rotate along with the Earth in order to preserve causality, um, there is still small effects of the same character, um, which essentially say that if you define an inertial frame um, at a fixed radius around the Earth's surface, um, then because of the Earth's rotation, uh, that frame will be altered um, a little bit um, as uh, time proceeds um, because of the rotation of the Earth. Uh, so the Gravity Probe B experiment was a, a very famous experiment which was designed to test this um, it's an extremely difficult experiment, um, which involved sending a gyroscope up into orbit and, and observing the precession of this gyroscope. Uh, the problem is that it's an, a very small effect. So uh, in electromagnetism, you learned that um, magnetic effects are always characteristically smaller than electric effects by a power of the velocity over the speed of light, right? This is something you probably learned. Um, the lens, the frame dragging effect, otherwise known as the gravitomagnetic effect, plays the same role to, uh, so the analogy that you want to keep in mind is that um, electricity is to magnetism as uh, new the Newtonian potential or Newtonian gravity is to uh, gravitomagnetic or frame dragging effects. So um, all of these frame dragging effects are suppressed by powers of the velocity over the speed of light. And if you have a satellite going around the Earth, um, the velocity over the speed of light is a very small quantity. Um, I don't know what it is, but it's small. And so that means that you need to study these, these uh, gyroscopes to a very, very high degree of accuracy. Um, and um, these gyroscopes are all made of metal. Um, metal has lots of charge carrying excitations. If you rotate a piece of metal to form a gyroscope, if you rotate, actually maybe it's not metal, maybe it's glass. If you rotate anything, um, then you'll induce very, very complicated high order um, <coughs> effects involving electromagnetism and you need to understand those effects to a very, very high degree of precision in order to subtract them out and discover the effect only due to gravity. And I think uh, what happened is they put this thing, they did a fantastic amount of work, they put this thing into orbit um, and it turned out there were high, new seventh order uh, you know, um, what is it called? You know, you have these induced magnetic dipole, these induced dipole moments um, that have some high order couplings. Um, this has a name in, that I'm spacing on. Um, anyway, there were some very complicated high order couplings due to the electromagnetic interaction of this gyroscope uh, with the experiment. And uh, so they couldn't get, they were down by an order of magnitude or two in accuracy. So it was a fantastically good uh, 
test of um, gravitational time dilation. It was a fantastically good uh, test of all of the Newton sort of standard Schwarzschild effects that one is used to, but the goal was really to test this qualitatively new effect, the gravitomagnetic or frame dragging effect, uh, which it failed at. Um, that's quite a sad story, actually, considering how much time and effort was put into the experiment. Yes? What's that? Gravity probe, gravity probe B. GPB, yeah. Um, sort of a minor scandal, actually. It was only a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, uh, that it flew. And it took four years, literally. The experiment was proposed in 1960. Um, it's a very, very difficult experiment. Other questions? But that's life, you know. I mean, in some ways, in 1960, it was a cutting edge uh, experiment, but the same features of general relativity have been experimentally tested in other ways since then, uh, primarily by uh, observing the gravitational radiation of, of pulsars. So there are these famous pulsar binary systems, um, which are emitting, you know, they emit an order one amount of their energy in gravitational radiation. So the amount of electromagnetic radiation that they emit is of the same order of the amount of gravitational radiation. So you can actually use the effects of general relativity to calculate um, how much energy they're losing due to gravitational radiation um, and match this with the observed uh, loss of energy of this uh, pulsar binary system. Uh, this is Taylor and somebody who won the Nobel Prize for it not too many years ago. Um, and that tests the same features of general relativity because it involves strongly coupled gravity in a rotating system. Uh, good. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, well, trying to decide what to do. Okay. Um, I probably don't have time to do everything. Maybe I do. Um, let's give it a try. So, uh, someone asked what happens if you jump into uh, the ring singularity inside a Kerr black hole. But before we even do that, we need to ask what happens if we jump inside the horizon of a Kerr black hole. So you might ask the following question, which is, is there another universe behind the horizon of a Kerr black hole, just like there was uh, for the Schwarzschild black hole? And it turns out that the answer is no, there's not another universe behind the horizon. In fact, there are an infinite number of universes behind the horizon of the Kerr black hole. So in order to do that, we need to find the analog of the Kruskal coordinates for the Kerr black hole. Uh, this is a sort of uh, gnarly task that I'm not going to go through for you. But what I will just do is draw for you the corresponding Kruskal diagram of the Kerr black hole. Okay, I'm going to have to give myself a lot of space here. Okay, so how does this work? So let's imagine that we're some observer, and this is our asymptotic Minkowski region. And this is the horizon. So we're sitting out here at some position of finite radius. Okay, you can get an idea of the scale uh, based on where I've drawn um, this. So this is our asymptotic Minkowski space. And the horizon of the Kerr black hole is a pair of lines at 45 degrees, just like it was uh, in um, the Schwarzschild black hole. And when you jump through the horizon, we then ask, what will you discover? Well, there's another horizon on the other side. So just... As with the Schwarzschild black hole, if we followed some space-like trajectory through the horizon, we would find another asymptotic Minkowski space over here. So there's another universe. But because there are two event horizons rather than one event horizon, the Kruskal diagram actually looks a little bit different. So we have an outer event horizon at R+, plus, an inner event horizon 
at R minus, and the ring singularity is only inside this um, inner event horizon. So unlike the Schwarzschild case, where the singularity was time-like, so it lay in the future, here the singularity is space-like, and it lies uh, along uh, some pair of curves, so there are two singularities, um, that lie on some vertical lines in the Kruskal diagram. Remember, I'm drawing a diagram where light rays travel on 45 degree lines. Anything that is uh, more vertical than 45 degrees is time-like. Okay, but you can see from this picture that you're not forced to, if you follow a time-like trajectory, hit the singularity. Instead, you could go through and you would find another outer horizon. And there's another asymptotic or another pair of asymptotic Minkowski regions outside those pair of event horizons. And there's another event horizon inside here and another inner event horizon with another pair of singularities and so on and so forth. So, in fact, this uh, goes all the way down, right? It's, what is this? Uh, it's elephants all the way, it's tortoises all the way down. So, in fact, there are an infinite number, there are an infinite chain, not drawing this very well, there's an infinite chain of asymptotic infinities and an infinite chain, uh, an infinite chain of uh, other universes behind the horizon, uh, sorry, here it is, of the Kerr black hole. And you can jump in to the horizon of one Kerr black hole, into the black hole horizon, and jump out of the white hole horizon of another Kerr black hole in another universe. And then if you don't like that universe, you can jump back, in, back into the black hole horizon uh, of that Kerr black hole and jump out of the white hole horizon of another Kerr black hole in another universe, and so on and so forth. And you can do it all day. Now, as before, um, I should emphasize that even though there are an infinite number of asymptotic Minkowski spaces and an infinite number of singularities, one shouldn't take this all too seriously because this is, in fact, just an artifact as it was for the Schwarzschild black hole of the fact that we're looking at an eternal solution. And for Kerr black holes, which are formed from collapse, uh, there will be uh, no such uh, effect, and we will only have one asymptotic infinity and one singularity. So what happens if you look at a black hole which is formed from collapse is that this singularity and that singularity they bend over to become something that looks like that. They connect. Any questions on that? Yes. Um, it, was, it was kind of obvious how in Torsha's solution, the white hole was, was an artifact. But here, um, okay, your, your black hole doesn't say something you asked about it. Yeah, I can say the same words. If I imagine that I have some solution which has uh, some distribution of matter which carries some mass and angular momentum that's very, very uh, widely distributed, my space-time should be as uh, approximately Minkowski space, and there's nothing special going on there. So for the same reason that the white hole singularity of a Schwarzschild is an artifact of an eternal black hole, so it is an artifact for the Kerr black hole. Ah, so what happens is that, in fact, that's a very good question. Um, so what happens physically is the following. The black hole horizon is a surface of infinite redshift. So any small amount of energy that you have will get redshifted down to zero as you go across the horizon. 
That's the outer horizon. The inner horizon is a surface of infinite blue shift, not red shift. So any small amount of matter gets redshifted to infinite energy. So any small fluctuation of the space-time, if I try and jump through the inner horizon and I'm carrying with me um, a physics paper that I don't like very much, uh, that physics paper has a certain amount of energy that gets blue shifted until it becomes infinite. And an infinite amount of energy will cause a black hole to form. It will cause uh, space-time to collapse into a singularity. So that's why I say this region of the geometry will instead get capped off uh, near R minus. So the R minus region, so in physically, it'll get capped off like that somehow. Because this R minus surface is a surface of infinite blue shift. And surfaces of infinite blue shift are where every approximation that you've made has failed. Because any small perturbation of the space time will cause it to collapse. Uh, that's not something that you can, you, uh, you know, that's not something I'm expecting you to understand uh, in any degree of precision. Uh, but roughly speaking, if you think of these horizons of surfaces of infinite blue shift, uh, then that's the physics that's going on. Good question, though. Any other questions? Okay. Now, as was anticipated by um, one of the questions that we had earlier, um, it turns out that even if we add uh, electromagnetism, the story is relatively unchanged. So every black hole will now be described by a mass, an angular momentum, and a charge. And we will still have a no-hair theorem. And indeed, even if you added other more complicated forces, so in the nuclear forces that describe the interactions at the core of an atomic nucleus, we have various other cousins of electromagnetism known as the strong and electroweak forces, um, objects that are charged under them, um, such as uh, leptons, quarks, and so forth. And there are black holes that one can construct that are charged under these various forces. But all of these are going to be uh, essentially irrelevant when you're considering uh, gravitational physics, simply because gravitational physics is uh, important only on very large length scales, where only long-range forces, namely gravity and electromagnetism, uh, are relevant. So, for example, um, if you believe that black holes will be created at the LHC, uh, then, in fact, it is important to think about black holes that might carry charge under the nuclear forces. Um, but if we are studying black holes of the sort that we see in the sky, then only the mass, angular momentum, and charge are relevant. And because... Uh, charged objects tend to attract and uh, neutralize uh, their respective charges. In fact, astrophysical black holes will only carry an infinitesimal amount of charge and so can, uh, to a great degree of accuracy, be described only by their mass and angular momentum. So um, I had a few more things that I wanted to say about black holes. Um, let me just end uh, with one um, comment, uh, which is a comment regarding the nature of singularities in general relativity. So all of the solutions that we have described have singularities. And so you could ask whether singularities are a general feature of the theory of general relativity. And it turns out that there is a sense in which singularities are inevitable. And this is because of what are known as the singularity theorems.
of uh, Hawking and Penrose, uh, which say uh, essentially that singularities are inevitable. So I don't want to make a, a terribly precise statement um, or even uh, an attempt at a proof of the singularity theorems. But let me just tell you um, the basic idea. So what we would like to do is we would like to ask if I start out with some reasonably nice distribution of matter and curvature in space, will it collapse and form a singularity? So what Hawking and Penrose did is they formed a necessary criteria for the formation of a singularity in the future. And the criteria is phrased as follows. So let's imagine that we have a sphere. So let's imagine that we have a two-sphere. Okay. So there's some two-sphere. And let's imagine that we attach a light bulb to every point on the surface of the two-sphere. And then we turn on the light bulbs. And we ask where the light goes. So typically, the light will go in one of two directions. So we could imagine, for example, uh, attaching a flash bulb uh, from a camera. Well, that's very old fashioned. You probably have never seen cameras with flash bulbs. But you could imagine attaching the flash bulb of a camera to um, each point on the surface of the sphere, uh, flashing those flash bulbs and asking what directions that what those uh, light rays will go. And typically, the light rays will go in one of two directions. Uh, one set of light rays will go outside in the direction of increasing radius of the sphere. And the other will go in, in the inside direction towards uh, a direction of decreasing radius of the sphere. So the light rays will typically go in uh, two directions, those of increasing radius of the sphere and decreasing radius. However, it's possible that the curvature of space-time could be such that both of the light rays will go in the direction of decreasing radius. So if both light rays will go in the direction of decreasing radius, then we have what is known as a trapped surface. That's the definition of a trapped surface. And alternatively, if we have um, both of those light rays which go in a direction of increasing radius, we have what is called an anti-trapped surface. And the theorem of Hawking and Penrose is that if space-time has a trapped surface, then the matter will evolve to a singularity sometime in the future. And likewise, if you have an anti-trapped surface, then you have a singularity in some time in the far past. And the only assumption in this equation is Einstein's equation along with some matter because we need to solve Einstein's equations coupled to some matter. And you need to assume that the matter is nice in some sense. So the assumption is that the matter obeys some, some positive energy condition. 
Now, in general relativity, there's no canonical notion of energy, so there's no canonical uh, way of formulating a positive energy theorem, positive energy condition, and so there are various different singularity theorems which are formulated for different types of uh, condition on the matter. But roughly speaking, if the matter in your theory is nice, then a trapped surface will lead to a singularity, and an anti-trapped surface will lead to a singularity in the far past. So typically, what this means is that singularities are inevitable. But it turns out that in all of the situations that people study, these singularities are always hidden by horizons. So these singularities are typically hidden behind horizons. And so uh, there is a conjecture formulated by Hawking, which is known as the cosmic censorship conjecture, which says that every singularity is going to be hidden by a horizon of some sort. This conjecture can be proven only in some restricted circumstances with some significant assumptions about the type of matter present. Now, there is one rather important example of a spacetime which has an anti-trapped surface, and that example is our universe. So it turns out that these theorems use the fact that there is an anti-trapped surface in our observable universe, and so they imply that there is a singularity in the far past of our universe. So if one makes so we observe that our universe was is expanding, and that means that at earlier times our universe had a smaller size and a higher energy density. And if you keep following this evolution backwards, you will see that eventually it had such high energy density and such small size that you have a singularity. And the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose provide a mathematical proof of this fact, provided you assume that all of the matter in our theory of nature um, is nice in some sense, uh, which we could make precise. So this singularity in the far past has a name. Uh, we call it the Big Bang Singularity. And uh, starting next time, we will develop uh, the theory of cosmology, where we will understand uh, this singularity and its implications in greater detail. So that's where uh, I thought we could end. But maybe before doing so, let me see if there are any questions. Yes? Not initially, but at some point in the collapse process it will form. So really these trapped surfaces form inside the horizon of a black hole. So once the gas, once everything has collapsed so that it's inside its own horizon, that is a trapped surface. And then you can show, no matter what happens, I mean, we just solved vacuum Einstein's equation, but you can show, no matter what sort of matter you have, that there's still a horizon. Uh, sorry, still a singularity.